Welcome back to Pat Psychology Masters. I have big news to begin. So I recently joined the O'Connell Lab at Trinity College Dublin, led by Professor Redmond O'Connell. Redmond and the rest of the O'Connell team do some fascinating research in the area of perceptual decision making. What the hell is that? <laughs> Here you ask. Let me give you some examples. Imagine a fly buzzing around your head. You pick up a swatter and swipe at it. Now, identifying the right place to swat involved a lot of perceptual decision making. Judging the future position of the fly based on what you could hear and what you could see. Another example of a perceptual decision is when you decide the speed of an oncoming car before you make a right turn. Or maybe a left turn if you're watching this outside of Ireland. Now, one last example. Deciding if a book is upside down or the right way up. Another perceptual decision. Now, these are just a few obvious examples of perceptual decision making. Our waking lives actually consist of a continuous stream of perceptual decisions we make in a seemingly effortless and instant way. Proper perceptual decision making is so important that if we fail to do it correctly, we risk serious injury and death. Understanding how the brain performs perceptual decision making is one of the big questions in modern neuroscience and psychology. And developing our understanding will have huge implications outside of simply satisfying curiosity for such a fascinating subject as decision making. This understanding will help us treat and diagnose clinical issues, for example. Anyway, the point is that I am absolutely delighted to help assist in the extremely impressive work that the O'Connell team conduct. In today's video, I'll be focusing on a preprint paper from the O'Connell Lab written by Elaine Corbett and colleagues titled Multiphasic Biases in Perceptual Decision Making. The authors of the paper wanted to investigate how we make perceptual decisions when we're value biased to choose a specific option. Now, although the title might sound complicated, I promise you the paper reports some straightforward and really interesting findings. The link to the full paper is in the description below the video. And if you find this episode interesting, I strongly suggest you follow the link to take a deeper dive into the research. So, have you ever seen somebody on the street and done a double take? Did you ever second guess yourself when you thought you saw something unusual? I certainly have. Recently, I was going out for a bag of chips in Malahide, a seaside village in North County Dublin. As I was eating my chips, I looked up, saw somebody, looked back down at my afternoon meal, and quickly looked back up to take a second look at the person that I had just seen. Now, I was convinced it was one of Ireland's most famous soccer players, Robbie Keane. But I began to second guess myself. I asked my friend beside me if he saw the person in question and he confirmed that, yes Pat, it was indeed Robbie Keane. So this story touches on a recent development in our understanding of perceptual decision making. It's predictive nature. When I'm casually eating a bag of chips, I'm not expecting to see my, a childhood hero of mine, someone I value greatly. And so, when I first saw Robbie Keane, I looked back down at my food, dismissing my hunch. I thought, I must be biased to misidentify anyone who looks remotely like Robbie Keane, the soccer superstar I value so much. However, once my brain did a bit more work to process the information received by my eyes, I was immediately compelled to do a double take. I was so conscious of my Robbie Keane detecting bias that I ignored my hunch initially. My friend could have easily convinced me that I was seeing things when I asked them about it. To use the technical jargon of perceptual decision making neuroscience, I was biased with the higher value decision option of detecting Robbie Keane. The higher value being represented by activating my nostalgia and being able to talk about the experience with friends who share an interest in Ireland soccer history. Now there is a point to this anecdote. For me, it intuitively maps onto Dr. Corbett's experiment and its findings. Dr. Corbett understood from previous research that our decisions are biased by the value associated with particular outcomes. Imagine a juror who is hungry and tired. That juror is biased against dis dissenting from the majority jury decision so they can go home to eat and sleep. 
So perceptual decisions involving two choices are also understood to be value biased. Dr. Corbett wanted to dig deeper to understand how these biases manifest in brain processes. Dr. Corbett's experiment involved participants playing what's called a random dot kinematogram game on a computer screen, while their brain activity was measured using EEG, short for electroencephalography. Basically, the skull cap with all the electrodes in it, which measures the electrical activity of your cortex. This random dot kinematogram task involved numerous moving dots, some of which were randomly moving and others which were moving in one of two coherent directions, either left or right. In this random dot kinematogram game, the participants received points for each tri trial they got correct. Each random dot motion task where they responded with the correct direction of dot motion by pressing the corresponding button on the computer's mouse. So right click for dots moving right and left click for dots moving left. Before each trial, the participants were informed that a particular direction achieved more points than the other. 30 points compared to 10 points. In other words, the participants were biased with a higher value decision option. This higher value direction was displayed to the participants on the computer screen by an arrow indicating the higher value direction. The lower value direction was simply the opposite of the higher value direction displayed. And the value of each direction was randomized for each trial. The game was also conducted under time pressure, meaning that the participant needed to respond to the stimuli of moving dots as quickly as they could. The participants, who were paid to take part in the study, were informed that they would receive an extra money bonus if they performed well in the task, so they are motivated to do it well and to get as much points as they could. Using the EEG data collected from the participants when they were playing this game, Dr. Corbett was able to examine two separate regions of the brain involved in planning the motor response required to press the relevant button on the mouse. These brain areas are contralateral to the finger used to press the relevant mouse button. So for a right button click, I'm using the left side of my brain. And for a left button click, I'm using the right side of my brain. Now, if you're interested in why our brains have this contralateral organization, check out the video I recently made on the subject, which should appear above my left hand Anyway, by analysing the data from these motor preparation regions, Dr. Corbett and colleagues discovered that there were three distinct phases of cortical electrical activity measured from participants corresponding to the higher and lower value directions that the participant had to choose from on each trial. The first two of these three phases began before the stimulus was presented, and I'll go through these three phases now. Phase one. Brain activity selecting for the higher value direction began earlier than brain activity for the lower value direction. But, phase two, brain activity selecting for the lower value direction played catch up just before the stimulus was presented. Then, phase three, once the stimulus was presented, there was a burst of activity favoring the higher value option. Although there was a clear preference for the participant towards one dot motion outcome, the higher value outcome, the one that rewarded more points, the participant still wants to be correct in order to not be left with zero points for an incorrect response. The anticipatory activity of the two separate decision making regions illustrates this competitive process very well. In other words, phases one and two I just described. Now the two sets of brain activity one favouring the higher value direction, the other favouring the opposite direction, are applied by the decision making regions of the brain in opposition to one another. They are competing against each other. Dr. Corbett and her co-authors eloquently describe the opposing portions of brain activity as being in a race to threshold. In other words, the motor preparation signals being measured by the EEG are in a race to reach a certain threshold in order for a decision to be consciously made by the participant. This decision time can be measured when the participant clicks the specific button on the mouse. Now, there's an interesting way to think about these experimental results. Perhaps the brain is adopting a particular decision-making strategy 
where only a small amount of evidence is required to hit the high value direction button. But what if the evidence isn't available? Well then, motor preparation activity for the lower value button is quickly pushed towards its threshold of activation to give the lower value option a chance. So how does this relate to my encounter with Robbie Keane? Well, let's imagine these results are generalizable to face detection. Being primed with the idolization of Robbie Keane as a childhood hero, I only needed a little bit of evidence to reach the threshold of the high value option of, yes, that is Robbie Keane. However, being familiar with the effect biases can play on decision making, I reputed my hunch, and the lower value option overtook the higher value option in the race to threshold for my final decision. During this reassessing period, I took a double take. This double take gave the higher value option the burst of activity it needed to win this race to threshold. Now, let me issue an important disclaimer. My Robbie Keane encounter analogy is not a perfect one for a few reasons. Perhaps most importantly, it is loaded with another extremely important variable in addition to option value, outcome probability. The man I saw could have been anybody. That is to say that there are numerous decision options for who the man could have been. In Dr. Corbett's simple but elegant experiment, there were only two decision options, each as likely as the other, but with one being more or less valuable than the other. So there you have it. We are able to measure biases at the level of brain activity. As we learn more about these simple perceptual decisions, we will develop that better understanding of the whole brain and its processes that I described in the beginning of the video. This deeper understanding will help us develop diagnostic tools for people with clinical issues, as well as help satisfy our curiosity for what's going on under the hood of our skulls. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon for future videos. It's totally free and always will be. Hit thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, Hit thumbs down if you didn't, and I'd be absolutely delighted to hear what you thought of this episode in the comments, and let me know if you have any questions. Don't forget to check out Corbett and Colleagues' paper via the link in the description, and I really look forward to seeing you here again soon. Thank you so much for watching.